So I met um, uh, Susie Myers Madison on my Facebook uh, page for the uh, book, and uh, she said her dad was in the was an actual union steward for Local 299, and was good friends with Jimmy Hoffa. So um, he gave me her number. I'm going to give him a call. If he answers. Hello. Please. Hello. Oh hi. I was calling for Mr. Um, Myers. Well, he's not here right now. I was calling. Oh okay. Um, well, I met his uh, daughter Susie. Um, oh, what? you just missed him. He oh. would love to talk to you. Okay. <laughs> about the Teamster stuff, right? Yeah, I wrote the book. I I I think he had a chance to read it. Um, so I think he did. Okay. What's a good time to call back where I can reach him? He uh, just went to the store. Oh, I okay. would say in an hour. In about an hour? Okay. Yes. That's, I'll give him a call back in about an hour. Okay. okay thank and, you. And my name's David Tubman. David? Right. Uh -huh. Okay. I will tell him. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate Thanks, it. David. Bye now. Okay. Bye. Bye. Let me try this again. Yes. Oh, hi. This... Oh, great. Uh, should I call back in a few minutes, or is it still a good time? No, he'll talk to you. Oh, great. This is the fellow about the Teamster book. Hi. Hi, this is Mr. Myers. Uh, should I call you Dick or Richard? Uh, whatever you want to call. I've been called a lot of things. <laughs> Dick, Richard, well, I'll, uh, I was told to call you Dick, if that's all right. Yeah. What's going on? Well, you know, if that, if you don't mind, I, you know, I wrote a book because of what my parents saw. I don't know if you recall, or you got a chance to read it, right? Well, I started it, but I've been going so much here with what's going on. With yeah. The, with the holidays and everything, I haven't finished it. Well, I don't know how far you got, but essentially, my parents happened to drive by as they were taking Hoffa away from the Red Fox that day. And so what they saw was the car pulling out, and it pulled up right behind them, and then it followed right beside them down Telegraph Road. Yeah, yeah, I read that part of it. Oh, okay. And then I also I also put a, uh, and then so you know about the Raleigh house and the garbage truck. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then I also uh, gave a link. I don't know if you, if you haven't had time to finish the book, you probably didn't see the link, but it was... Uh, when my mom was still alive in 2009, I had just called uh, Hoffa's daughter, Barbara Crancer, and told her the story. And I guess um, the FBI never relayed that story to her that my mom had told them just in 2006. So she, they never told anybody until then. I convinced her to talk to the FBI when I saw they were digging up a farm looking for Hoffa's remains. But rather than that... Um, I wanted to find out how, how your experiences were. You were a shop steward, I guess, or a local 299 steward, is that right? Yeah, for, for 12 years. Wow, from what year? Uh, when did you start? Oh, uh, probably 70, oh, uh, golly, right after Hoffa got out of prison. Uh-huh, oh, okay. Um, 71. We were there when he got out of prison. Uh-huh. And uh, he was coming back, and he was, uh, Nixon paroled him, and uh, he was coming back, and we had a group down at the hall when he come back, and uh, he was going to, you know, get back into the union, and uh, we were wanting him, you know, he was strong, very strong, sure. he was a very, very intelligent. Yeah, I was uh, still living there. Streetwise. Street sure. That was nineteen. I, I, that was nineteen seventy one, by the way. Was it seventy one? Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's when he got out. Mm -hmm. That's when Hoffa got out of prison, or did he go to prison? No, he was in prison in sixty seven. He was let out early in seventy one, and then okay. he and then in seventy five when he disappeared, 
I don't know if you knew this, but that week he was supposed to be all clear to go ahead. He already went through the Court of Appeals, you know, to get that restriction off. And uh, he, he had won, and uh, they were going to announce it that week. So, um, okay. yeah. Uh, well, I, I, I knew Chuck O'Brien real well. Oh, did you? Okay. Oh, yeah, Chuck. Uh, uh, in fact, even before I was uh, young, I'm 80 years old now, and I've, I've forgotten a lot of the stuff, but... Oh, sure. Uh, back when Chucky was a trustee in 299, uh -huh. he was uh, he was involved with uh, shipping containers and the steel and, and the riverfront. Right. And uh, I would be, uh, trucking out of there, uh, probably almost every day, because I had that was my job, uh, loading containers and uh, yeah. uh, loading uh, freight, you know. Yeah. And uh, I was there every day, and I got to know Chucky through that, and there was times when he'd have me, <laughs> Uh -huh. well, he's out playing, you know. <laughs> and, uh, were you, yeah, oh, yeah, he, you and him were about the same age, weren't you? Uh, no, I think he might have been a year or two older. Well, than yeah, me. well, pretty close, yeah. Well, pretty close, pretty close, yeah. yeah. But uh, I, I got the dog pretty well, and I, my personal opinion was, Yeah. Well, you know, he did admit to driving the car, uh, yeah, yeah, the Mercury. Yeah. And, um, okay, so um, around that time, do you remember any special events that might have seemed suspicious to you around uh, Hoffa's disappearance, which would have been uh, July uh, 30th, 1975? Anything around then that comes to mind? No, not really. Yeah. No. Did you ever ha have a... Uh, any stories as far as what might have happened? Well, I, I knew uh, oh, bah, 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 Roland McMaster's real well. Oh yeah. And he was he, he was one of uh, office tough guys. Yeah. And uh, he, I believe he knew something about it too. Uh, in fact, they tore up his uh, farm. Yeah. Uh, building and blah 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 and. Uh, Another business agent or trustee with George Roxborough, uh -huh. which was uh, a 299, uh, he was the vice president at that time, and Dave Johnson. And these guys were all uh, with the Teamsters back then. And sure. uh, uh, I knew Jimmy Jr. real well. He represented me when I, f I was fired for uh, creating the work stoppage in Detroit at one time. Oh. And, uh, he represented me, but he couldn't carry his dad's shoes, you know. He was nothing like his dad. Uh huh. Well, his dad kind of sheltered him from that part of the uh, union involvement, didn't he? He, he was kind yeah, of. Kinda, yeah, yeah, yeah. He was an attorney back then, mm -hmm. and he'd become an attorney for the 299, and uh, that's when he, that's when I was fired, and he represented me. But uh, we did our own fighting. It wasn't through Jimmy Hoffa Jr. that. We got our, our jobs back, you know. Sure. But it was it was it was uh, really it was scary times. I mean, I was riding around with the goons and Cadillacs during the national strikes when Alpha got the national trade agreement, and uh, oh, some of the things that went on just scared the hell out of me. You know? I'll bet. Yeah, yeah, it scared the hell out of me, but uh, I went along with it, and uh -huh. uh, you know. Well, yeah, you had no choice. And, you know, I grew up in Detroit. I lived there from 1960. I was a kid. I was 24 during uh, the time when Hoffa disappeared. And, and uh, I ended up moving from um, uh, Michigan in 1976. So my mind was really kind of on that. But I was living with my parents. And uh, when, uh, you know, of course, when they saw what was going on, they thought, saw the two guys in the back, big guys, my mom said. And uh, um, O'Brien was just staring at them, uh, you know, staring at the car. My dad told her, quit looking, that's the mafia, because he recognized O'Brien. They didn't see Hoffa, but these guys had their legs pushed way up into their chin and their chest. So they were, and my mom saw a strap. And, of course, they weren't thinking Hoffa. She thought they had a dog or something on the, on the bottom of the black 
you know, yeah, the floorboard. No dog. It had to be off well, that's what my dad said. He said that was no dog. Yeah. <laughs> but they didn't know until two days later when it hit the headlines. That's when they realized what they saw. Yeah, and yeah. because I was living with them, um, I was there when they first heard it on the news, but they had already seen the headline, and then it struck them. And, and when I heard them, uh, I was listening to the news with them, and, my, and when the newscaster said that he was last seen at the Red Fox, my dad said, like hell, we saw him at the Raleigh house. And of course, you know, he was just, he was just eight months older than, um, than Hoffa, so, you know, he's from the same generation. But the whole book, the whole book that I wrote was really, it, it was never intended to be a book. You know, I just collected information, and when my mom passed away in 2011, uh, I convinced her to tell the FBI right after the McMaster farm dig that uh, they're still looking for the body, Mom. Didn't you ever tell the police? And she said, no. And so I said, well, they're still looking. Would you be willing to tell them the story? And so she did. So she did tell them in Detroit. I was yeah. living in California. But uh, I've got the transcript from that. That's in the book, too. I don't know if you ran across that yet. And then well, also... I got, I got huh? to the part where uh, they were driving down, uh, what was it? Uh, Telegraph. Telegraph. Yeah. And uh, they, they seen, they seen uh, the guy in the back seat with the two goons uh, trying to get up. And he said they were, her knees were like they were holding her down. And uh, I didn't get... Much beyond that oh, okay. Well, when you get a chance to read it, and I don't want to ruin the progress of the book, because the way I wrote the book was kind of a time frame. When uh, my dad was in Miami, when we lived in Miami, Florida, it was during the time when Hoffa actually became president. And um, he was actually snitching on Dave Beck at the time. You probably heard all these stories, but he was actually trying to create uh, the presidency vacancy by telling the feds about Dave Beck's involvement with the mob. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So that opened it up for him in 1958, I believe. We were there in 57, 58, and 59, and my dad uh, managed Valmoral, which was on the strip in uh, Miami Beach, so he knew what was going on during the, the uh, convention there, the Teamster convention. And so that was the first time he ever heard of Hoffa, I think, but because uh -huh. uh, he continued in the restaurant business when we moved to Detroit, he ran a, uh, a restaurant called Darby's. And I don't know if you ever remember a place called Darby's. Uh, Sam, Sam Boeski was uh, the owner, and he was associated with the Purple Gang in Detroit. And uh, the mafia, you know, people, you know, organized crime figures, I guess, would come into Darby's because of that association. And my dad had to know who was who, but that's where uh, he, I believe he got to know who Chucky O'Brien was, and perhaps he came in with off the who knows. But um, what happened, the reason he left Darby's in 1968 was because he kind of inherited or bought Sam Boeski's Mark IV Lincoln Continental. It was in 1959. And he was so thrilled about the car, he went to drive it home, went to get gas, and the guy said, you're a lucky man. And he says, the fuse that went into your gas tank fell out, but you're supposed to... Uh, blow up when you started this car and he didn't know if it was because he had switched juice companies he, he switched from home juice company that week which is owned by Tony and uh, Vito Giacalone and uh, I know those names ring a bell to you uh, but he didn't know if it was that or they thought it was still Samboeski's car but he never went to the police then either but that's the reason, uh, if you fast forward to what they saw that day uh, in the Raleigh house, the reason they didn't go was because of that experience. He didn't want to, uh, you know, face the retaliation, obviously for the family's sake. You know, he, he had three kids, I was one. But uh, that was what stuck in his mind and why they never went to the police. Once they went to, once he passed away, my mom, I was going to bring her out, but she was still in Detroit. Uh, and she did talk to the FBI. Uh, everything we figured, well, that's what she needed to do with this story, you know, finally tell the FBI. So we figured that's all we need to do. And then uh, I moved her out to California to live with me. And in 2009, we sat down and saw the movie Hoffa for the first time with Jack Nicholson. Yeah. <laughs> did, a, did you see that, that one? Was a, that was a <laughs> Well, it was, but, you know, we were kind of naive. We were watching it like it's a documentary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, but at yeah. the end, we both looked at each other and said, what was that? <laughs> and it got, it got me curious. That's why I called Barbara Crancer. I wanted, and I didn't, I wasn't about to call Hoffa Jr. because he was the current Teamster president. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he was international. Yeah, and he was in, 19, in uh, 2009. He was the president then. I guess he's leaving yeah. next year, but he's still the president. So anyway, what it amounted to. Yeah, he is. He is. Till next year. Till, well, till this year. He's going to leave this year. Uh, and I didn't speak to him until 2019, but I did speak to him about this. Oh, you did talk to him? Yeah, I did. Finally did. And I also talked to Chucky O'Brien's stepson, Jack Goldsmith. And that was. No, nobody did, but he came out with a yeah. book called In Hoffa's Shadow, and that was September of 2019, and I got a hold of him. Chucky was still alive. Of course, he didn't yeah, die yeah. until uh, a year ago. Uh, on Hoffa's birthday, Chucky O'Brien passed away. That's when he passed away in Florida. Yeah, he was in Boca Raton, Florida. Yeah, yeah Boca Raton, yeah. Yeah, but he was still alive. I've got a picture of him holding up uh, uh, a family picture of... Um, uh, Hoffa and his wife Josephine, and it turns out that picture was taken at the Raleigh House. Hmm. And I and it was when he got out of prison, he had his coming home party at the Raleigh House. At the Raleigh House, I think, yeah. I don't know if you knew that. But no, no, I, uh, let me see, was I retired then? Well, that would have been 75. Oh, no, yeah, no, that, yeah, yeah. So you were still involved, right? In uh, oh, yeah, Teamsters? Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, um, well, I had some exciting times, but there's not much I can really tell you. I can tell oh, you about Chuck Bryan and, yeah. uh, you know, uh, the guy Dave Johnson's boat being blown up there and uh, uh, Grosio and uh, Nick Bastard's getting beat up and, uh, right. uh, you know, different things. Uh, but there's not, the only thing I really knew a lot about was Chuck O'Brien and all that. Right. Uh, well, actually, I was I was curious to just you know about your general experience too, not just about Hoppo because that I was I worked for the uh, union obviously, but not I, I worked at um, Ford Motor Company and then I worked at uh, Consolidated Freightways and UPS. Of course, those were all union jobs, so yeah, yeah. so I was familiar with you know how everybody respected Hoppo. Let me tell you real quick, uh, you know I dated an Italian girl from Dearborn, and. Um, uh, I was in high school. I was a senior in high school when we met, 1969. And um, her family, they weren't, of course, in the mafia or anything, but uh, they knew Tony Giacalone. And uh, I went with her and her mom uh, to go visit the Giacalones in St. Clair Shores. So I got to meet Zita, I guess is his wife's name. And she sent some cookies home with me. And, you know, we didn't sit with them but because uh, we were just kids, you know. But... Um, uh, I remember the place. It was, I think, St. Clair Shores, and I remember it was a little peninsula, so there was water on uh, two or three sides of where we sat, wherever his house was. And then uh, we ended up going to see the Supremes with them. Ah, okay. And my mom went with us. We went to the Fisher Theater. So this would have been like the summer of 69. And um, so we go in separate limos. Um, my girlfriend's mom was the one that knew them real close, real good. But um, my mom and my girlfriend and I are sitting in one limo, and then we go see him. And then on the way back, we stop at some Italian restaurant uh, for pizza. And we're the only ones in the restaurant, except there's five or six guys in trench coats and hats standing around us watching us eat. <laughs> and you probably ran across cases like that, too, if you hung out with Hoffa. Is that right? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, he had some big boys. He I'll had bet. Some big boys. Oh, I've seen, I've seen uh, some of the things them guys did, and it just, oh, man. Yeah. Scared the hell out of me. <laughs> oh, I'll bet. But uh, let me ask you now, uh, what was your personal view? Did you feel like you were threatened, or did you feel like they were okay with you as long as you didn't cross them? What was your feeling at the time? Well, no, I wasn't. The only time I felt uh, threatened is when I got fired from my uh, my job for creating a work stoppage. I oh. worked for Central Transport. Matty Maroon, did you ever hear of him? No, I didn't, but uh, I'll look him up. He, What's his name? He owned yeah, Matt. Matty Maroon. Oh, okay. Really, Matthew Maroon. Oh, okay. Anyway, he was big back then. He, he's a, a multi-billionaire, but he, he just passed away this year. 
and his son is running the show now. Uh -huh. But uh, he was, I believe, well, him and Hoffa were tight. Yeah. And he, he got away with murder with the union. Uh -huh. Figuratively. And, yeah, he got away with murder <laughs> with the union. In fact, I was a union steward, and our company, Manny Maroon, would do anything he wanted. Yeah. Until we stopped him. Huh. And the union stopped him. I'd file a grievance, and uh, he would, he would, they would defeat the grievance and get away with it, you know. And uh, finally, uh, our president at that time was Bob Lenz. Oh. Uh -huh. And he told me that they were going to put Central on strike because of, of the violations with their roadmen delivering roads in the city and, you know, just violating yeah. the contract. Uh, left and right. Anyway, it got to the point where we were having our meeting out in Birmingham, and Maroon uh, had this high-class uh, room with a uh, table that was probably 20 foot in diameter, and uh, the business agents and the, and the president of the union was there, and uh, we all uh, were waiting for Maroon to come. Yeah. And so when we all went, well, we were waiting for Maroon to come. The president of the union tells us, guys, that we had, I had uh, my committee man and uh, another committee man with me, and the road steward had his committee man with him, and uh, the union was there with the vice president and two trustees and, right. uh, and uh, another trustee, and we were going into the meeting, but the, business, the president told us, guys, now, you guys don't say anything. We'll yeah. do the talking. We're going to get this thing straightened out. You know, so hey, yeah. the president, you know, let's go. So we go in there, and uh, we're sitting there all around that big table, and Maddie Maroon walks in, okay? Right. And he had a pencil in his hand, and he's twirling this pencil when he walked in. Oh. And when he walked in, he took that pencil threw it across that table, and he didn't say union men, he said picky. Yeah. He said, if you think you're going to change his operation, he said, I'll throw you right through the fucking window. Huh. And why, would, why would he blame you? Because I was the one that had the grievance file. Oh, oh. So, first of all, I wait for the president to speak up. Sure. Bob Lance. And I got up yeah. and I says, well, first of all, I says, we're not here to fight. We're here to resolve problems. And I says, besides that, Maddie, you're not mad enough to throw me through the window. <laughs> and I looked at Bob Lance and I says, have you anything to say? And he says, no, you guys do all the talk. Huh. And right then I just said to myself, this son of a gun. Yeah. What a coward he was to represent us guys and myself and my committee men. What's your first name? Mine's David. I, uh, my committee man got up and he says, we're not here to fight. We're here to resolve problems. And believe me, we walked out of that meeting. We didn't resolve a cotton picking thing. <laughs> All that wasted time, you know, and I, after that, I just got so discouraged with the with our president of the union. I just yeah. started coasting after that, and I finally resigned and went back to work. You know. So did he become um, <clears throat> did he become president of the Teamsters or just your union? Uh, oh, just just our local. Your your local. I just local oh, okay. He he was a he was a wimp <laughs> if there ever was one, you know, and he was right. representing us guys. Yeah. Well, Hoffa was the president of 299, right? Or no, not at that time. No. Oh, okay. Bob Lins was. Oh, this was after Hoffa, I believe, was in jail. And, oh, okay. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, after Fitzsimmons or before Fitzsimmons? Uh, no, Fitzsimmons was the president, the president of our 299. Oh, okay. No, wait. No, no, he wasn't. No, uh, Fitzsimmons was the international president. Oh, I okay. can't. Yeah, there's yeah, a difference. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah there's okay. a difference. I understand. That's what it's all about. But it's not talking about me. It's just right. about Hoffa and uh, uh, 
Chris Simmons and uh, Chucky, o Chucky O'Brien. He, he was the one that I knew the best. Well, I didn't know half of that. Well, I was in a documentary with them on television. Right. And I was uh, on television once. Uh, but uh, that was about it when he got out of prison. You know, there'd be right. group of us stewards there to get him out, you know, represent him and things like that. But, uh, you mean Chucky O'Brien was on, on television? And I, I'm sorry? Oh, did you say Chucky O'Brien was on television, or or you were? Uh, no, Chucky might have been on television oh. with the group, you know. Yeah. But uh, that was, that's about all I could really say about, about Hoffa and Chucky yeah. O'Brien. Let me ask you, uh, you know, Susie, she's your daughter, right, Susie? Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Uh, she mentioned something, and maybe it ties into the story you just told me. She said that uh, you were gone, and they got a call at the house that you weren't to be coming home. Does that tie into the story you just told me? Or do you, did you ever hear that from her? She, 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 uh, uh, that I wouldn't be coming home. She said you were gone, obviously for business, and they got a call at the house that said that you wouldn't, wouldn't be coming home, but you did come home. Uh, yeah, I come home. I, that, was, that was a threat by somebody. I don't know. Uh, I had been from that role in McMaster's when, we, when I was fired. Because he was following me all the way with it. We had to go all the way to Washington to get our jobs back, you know. Yeah. And uh, Roland McMaster's was a goon, and he was scary. He's asking me where I'm staying in Chicago yeah. and, and all things like that there. Now, he might have called the house. I was, I didn't know about it. I wasn't aware of that. I, nobody right. told me. Well, she told me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, she must have. She must have heard it or answered the phone or blah, blah, blah. I don't know. Yeah. But well, you weren't there. there. Yeah, yeah you, that you was know, the scary, the biggest scary part of my being uh, fired, you know. Yeah. So. But it all come out good for me. I, mm -hmm. I was reinstated, back pay. I was sued for a quarter of a million dollars back then for creating the work stoppage, and uh, through it all, I was uh, exonerated. My my committee man was, you know, put back to work, and uh, we got back pay, and mm -hmm. then they had to reinstate everything. So. Right. That was about the bottom line, but that's just the dirty stuff. Well, um, just so I understand the, the significance of it, because you know, I'm kind of into the union structure there, but you said that uh, you kind of helped orchestrate Central. Central what? Central, was it a trucking uh, farm? Central Transport, yes. Oh, Central, Central Transport. Central Parties was first, and then Central Transport was a part of it. Yeah. Then it went all into Central Transport, yeah. About what year do you think that was? Was that about... Um, when Hoffa was still in prison? Oh, no, that was before that. Yeah. Okay, because yeah, I... The transport started getting made back in the uh, early 60s. Oh, because it, it was, uh, he was in prison from 67 till um, two days before Christmas in 1971. 1971, yeah. Yeah, so you were, you were a steward, but this uh, strike that you helped orchestrate, I guess, um, was before he got out of prison, you say? Yeah. Oh, okay. I see. Oh, wait a minute. Now that, just a minute. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you remember when, that, when I was on strike with Petro, was that when Hoffa was in prison or was that before? He wasn't there. Yeah, my wife has got a very good memory. She yeah. was in prison at the time. Uh -huh. So, well, make, time. make sure your wife reads that book, too, then. <laughs> I'll bet. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, you got a pretty good memory too, to be honest with you. <laughs> uh, you know, I really, I really enjoy talking with you. I don't know if you're open to any other phone conversations, but I don't want to keep you. It's a Sunday night, but um, I know, you know, and not necessarily just about Hoffa, because, um, like I said, I, I, I worked in the union, so I, I kind of appreciate uh -huh. that lifestyle. But you were kind of up there. <laughs> Yeah. And that's when uh, UPS, I believe, come in and took them over. I see. But uh, they spent millions of dollars then trying to organize UP, uh, overnight truck lines, and uh, that didn't work. But uh, they were big back then. You know, yeah. When oh, yeah. Organizing and things like that. That's when the, the, the teamsters were strong. Oh, yeah. Uh, they got. They were really strong in the 70s. Um, yeah. Oh, he had, he had 
trade agreement uh -huh. where Hoffa had the power he could shut the whole country down. Oh, I know. Yeah, he had that power. You know what? It, I don't know if this was, if you'd like this or not, but I have a picture of uh, uh, when they had the um, McClellan Commission, and it's a picture of um, Robert Kennedy and Jack Kennedy sitting at a table, and they're playing with a Teamster truck. They did. But when I, I ran across that picture, I've done a lot of research, to be honest with you, but I ran across that picture. Yeah, it sounds like it, yeah. <laughs> well, I, I wish I could be more help, but I can tell you a lot of things oh. about the team. Uh, yeah, I'm just calling to shoot the breeze. I'm not I'm not trying to get yeah, any particular yeah. information. <laughs> Yeah. Probably better than, uh, well, I, I knew Rowan McBasters, and I knew all our guys from uh, 299 right. and, uh, when we were out organizing and uh, things like that. You know, there's uh, there's a couple of other names. So let me ask you if you knew who they were. Uh, Louis Lintow? Did you know who Louis Lintow was? He, um, no. he, had, uh, he had the uh, airline limousine service that Hoffa went to visit before the meeting oh, that day. Yeah. Uh -huh. And what about Bain? I forget his first name, but Bain. Oh yeah, uh, Joe Bain. Joe Bain, right? Yeah, he was he was uh, a union steward, and well, he worked worked for Roadway at that time, Roadway Truck Line, uh -huh. and he was a union steward then. But he got into the union as a business agent. Oh, I see. And then after that, Joe went to Pontiac as the, the president of the local the Teamsters in Pontiac. Uh -huh. And then he had a, a brother or son, Mike Baines, uh, uh -huh. was uh, in the union, and he was a steward, but I don't ever remember what happened to yeah. Mike if he got back in the union or, uh, uh, you know, business right. agent or trustee or something. Well, let me, uh, let me, yeah, let me tell you why Joe Bain comes to mind. Uh, now, he's the older, right? He's the older yes. one? Okay. Yeah. Now, now he uh, was friends with the Hoffa family, obviously, and so was Louis Lintow. Now, Louis Lintow claimed that Jimmy Hoffa called him at 3.30 that day he disappeared. And, of course, most of the stories had, had him disappearing at 2.30. And, of course, that's when my mom saw, my mom and dad saw them leaving the Red Fox. It was 2.30, not 3.30. Now, he called Louis Lintow right after he spoke to his wife right behind the Red Fox restaurant. And he told her they didn't show up, he's coming home. And then he called Louis Lintow. And, um, and that was within a minute or two. You know, he was really upset at the time. So he wasn't going to wait around 90 minutes, which is what Louis Lintow claims. And then, now Louis Lintow was on the phone with a guy named Charles Thomas. And he was actually the superintendent of the Metro Airport. But he was at 299 that day. And he was at the local. And he was on the phone with Louis Lintow at 2.30, and he claims a woman said, Hoffa's on the other line. And so Lintow had to hang up, and he said it was at 2.30. When the FBI interviewed Lintow, the phone records said it was 2.35, not, not 3.30. But Lintow actually testified before the September grand jury, and he had a couple of his employees back him up a little bit. So that was the whole thing that um, that was used to prove Hoffa wasn't in the car that day. But of course, uh, you may have also heard that it wasn't just a hair, but they had skin samples and blood samples, which they later um, tested with DNA. They didn't have DNA at the time, but they kept the, the samples and they tested and they were definitely from Jimmy Hoffa. It was his. Yeah, it was his. So that was in the back seat. Uh, the yeah. dogs, they had three teams of dogs that traced his scent to the back seat, and they picked up a little bit in the trunk, but they say that his body was never in the trunk. So my dad was hired at the Raleigh house as a manager in 1974, just the year before, but he turned it down the day before he was supposed to start. Because, you know, they, they catered to a lot of the Jewish clientele, and they had to have kosher food preparation uh, for a lot of the events, and my dad knew that from the Darby's restaurant in Detroit. So that's why they hired him. 
But he was uh, 62. That, that was how old Hoffa was that year. And uh, when he turned it down, he didn't work another day in his life. He took early retirement <coughs> because when he heard that uh, the Raleigh house was owned by the mafia, and that was uh, Joey Lieberman, who uh, was the owner, uh, who was tied into the Purple Gang. And, uh, of course, Hoffa had his coming home party there. So my dad was uh, describing the, the, the kitchen as being a regular meat market. I mean, it was a, a meat processing plant. It had giant band saws, had big sides of beef on hooks and rollers going into the meat lockers and floor drains to catch the blood runoff. And I mean, it, it would have been a perfect crime scene, really. And it turns yeah. out where they saw the car come to a park in the back was where the kitchen door was located. That's where the kitchen was in the back uh, would be the southeast corner. And I've found that out for certain from people that work there. I've run into some people since the book. Uh, one guy worked at Central Sanitation. He ran the uh, recycling department at, at Central Sanitation. And the reason why that became a, um, a subject in my book was because when they saw the car come to a park there in the back, right next to where they stopped was a Central Sanitation garbage truck. And that wasn't the day that they had their service. That was a Wednesday. And their service didn't happen until the following Friday. So, uh, Jay, I, I hate to cut you off. Oh, that's okay. They're eating dinner now, and I uh, got my two great granddaughters. Yeah. I do this, but uh, they're waiting for me. No, that's okay. I knew it was a Sunday night, and you were about getting here for dinner. So, thank you so much. And I, uh, it's a pleasure talking to you, Dick. And um, if something comes up, you want to call me, or if vice well, versa. I got your, your phone number's in the book. It's right? in the book, right? So. Yeah. Well, here's what I'd like to ask you about. Maybe you can think about it, and that's um, about you know how well you knew Chucky O'Brien, because I don't know that much about him. All right, so maybe just think about it, and we'll talk again. Okay. Okay. <laughs> hey, all right. Okay. Good talking to you, Dick. All right. My pleasure. All right. Bye Have now. Good night. You Bye. too. Bye now. That's Dick Meyer. <laughs>